Good morning, everybody. My name is Jacopo Monzi. I will uh, be your moderator for this uh, event. Before we start, I will leave the floor to our colleague from the Interpretation Unit to explain you very quickly and precisely how to manage the language options of this webinar. Over to you. Can you hear me? One, two, one, two. If you need English interpretation or English audio, please select the globe at the bottom right corner of the Zoom screen. Select English for English or Serbian for Serbian interpretation. And also check the mute original audio button. Now Serbian. Ukoliko vam je potreban prevod neke vrste ili pak želite da slušate audio na engleskom jeziku, odabrat ćete globus koji se nalazi na dnu sa desne strane. Kliknut ćete na taj globus, ispod piše Interpretation. Kada kliknete na taj globus, odabrat ćete engleski ili pak srpski i također ćete klirati opciju Mute Original Audio. I'm going to do this on the second channel as well in case somebody is already listening to Interpretation. All right, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, let's just go very quickly through today's agenda. We are going to have um, a very interesting welcoming speech from four speakers, Natasha Milch, Director of the Water Management Directorate, Milan Zadar, Regional Head of Agribusiness Central and Southeastern Europe, EBRD, Nabil Gangif, FAO Representative for Serbia, and Wafa Al Puri, FAO Investment Center Chief, Europe, <coughs> Central Asia, Near East, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean um, Assemblies. Immediately after the welcome speech, we're going to have three uh, presentations. Each will be followed by 10 minutes of question and answer directly related to the presentation. And we're gonna close this webinar with about half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour of uh, discussions, question and answers related to irrigation, governance, global challenges, and others. So I'm very glad to give the floor to the director of the Water Management Directorate, Madame Natasha Milic. The floor is yours for the welcome speech. Thank you very much. Good morning or good day, everyone. Warm greetings to all the participants of this well organized webinar um, titled um, Irrigation Management. I will remove my mask so you can hear me slightly better. The, uh, State Voter Directorate has the pleasure to participate in this webinar today. And as envisioned, we hope to hear best possible practices from Spain, Portugal, and Israel on the topic of irrigation. To begin with, I wanted to point out that the government of the Republic of Serbia has recognized this area of irrigation within the Ministry of Agriculture. Water irrigation is an important segment for the development of agriculture. And of course, irrigation and agriculture contribute a significant part to the national GDP. A lot has been done in terms of irrigation thus far, together with EBRD, that allowed us to obtain loans to build certain structures in parts of Serbia. This was the donation, this was the grant uh, from EBRD and FAO. And we also managed to develop a strategy uh, for irrigation for Serbia. This document is very important without any doubt, because only together with joint forces, with all stakeholders and interested parties, will be able to utilize this strategic document and the accompanying action plan to set up an irrigation system in the Republic of Serbia 
thus resulting in better agricultural production and better uh, climate change response. Climate changes are evident all around the world. We would like to thank everyone for their efforts, EBRD, FAO, all the experts that work with us, the participants of today's webinar, and we are waiting with impatience uh, to hear the uh, experiences of our colleagues from Portugal, Spain, and Israel uh, in related to irrigation and all other aspects of irrigation that we are very interested in. Thank you so much, and I wish us a successful webinar. Many thanks, Director, for your word and for your um, welcoming uh, speech. Uh, let me give quickly the floor to Milan Jale, the regional head of the Agribusiness Center in Southern, Southeastern Europe for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Milan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Please unmute your microphone, sir. Microphone Milian, is you, your microphone is closed. You have to open your microphone. Sorry. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Jacopo. Written in the chat. Right now, all the uh, okay. these can find the instruction instrukcije za prevod uključivanje isključivanje prevoda kao i jako važna napomena isključivanje originalnog zvuka da ne bi došlo do preklapanja originalnog spikera i prevoda nalazi se u chatu. Hvala. E, dobar dan svima. E, ja ću onda ipak na srpskom, nadam se da će ostali učesnici kojima treba First and foremost, I would like to welcome our partners from the government of the Republic of Serbia and the uh, Republic of uh, Management Director and also colleagues from FAO and all other participants in this very important initiative. I know this is not easy to organize. Organized live conferences is very strenuous and this is an even greater challenge. Um, I hope we, the situation will be much better in terms of the pandemic and we'll get a chance to meet in person in the future. Thank you to the colleagues from FAO for organizing this. It's one of the very first events that, that we've uh, prepared together with other uh, partners um, within the strategy for irrigation of the Republic of Serbia. Uh, you know, for us at the World Bank, you know, the agribusiness sector is an important sector. For the first time within our own strategy, we are actually dealing with irrigation itself. We understood that due to climate changes and everything that is happening, uh, irrigation is very important, especially in countries such as Serbia, countries that have potential to produce cereals, fruit, vegetables, and everything else that uh, is encompassed within agribusiness. As Ms. Natasha mentioned, we've already started implementing certain projects. We've signed the first contract, the grant contract, with the government of the Republic of Serbia and Serbia Waterworks uh, in the amount of 15 million euros for irrigation in Negotin and Stilinas. We hope this is only the beginning of cooperation that uh, uh, will ensure. We hope that uh, the government and all other stakeholders will recognize that this infrastructure is very important, that this irrigation infrastructure is important, and that with climate changes, uh, irrigation is, that is as important as road infrastructure, real infrastructure, and all other types of infrastructure. For that reason, with partners from FAO and the government of the Republic of Serbia, we agreed to develop this strategy in order to. Um, this is this is a document based on analytic uh, analytic uh, data in order to maximize the potential of agriculture in Serbia. Of course, we need to uh, pay attention to sustainable. A development and climate change when it comes to our strategy. This strategy will be the basis for 
the development of the investment plan, less than the action plan, that we'll be able to manage uh, the project in a systemic way. We certainly want to become a partner in further financing and supporting the various stakeholders in various projects. Uh, our annual assembly of stakeholders, uh, uh, we organized the webinar for our stakeholder meeting. Unfortunately, we will have a physical stakeholder meeting. Investments until 2025 will will have green investments. Um, uh, in that regard, uh, irrigation, uh, flood management, uh, it's all in the heart of this new strategy, which provide us with the possibility to deepen our cooperation and finance future projects. Uh, this is the very first event, and our presenters today really come from countries which um, have a lot of experience, have uh, very innovative solutions. Israel, Spain, Portugal, their results speak volume. I would like to thank them to, for their willingness to participate today and again uh, to be with us, uh, with our FAO colleague actually dealing with irrigation. I hope all of you, together with private companies and other institutions that deal with this issue, will have a very fruitful, very uh, active discussion. This is one um, of many events we'll have. We hope this will be an interactive process. We spoke to Ms. Natasha and its management in Serbia Waters, or Serbia Waters. This is a joint project, this is a joint strategic document, a strategic pathway. Uh, we all want to participate together with Serbia in this in order to make sure um, we increase uh, the development of the agricultural sector that is very important for the economy of Serbia. Again, thank you for everyone. We from EPRD are at your disposal for any questions you may have, and we hope we will continue implementing projects that we've started. Thank you, Jacopo, and have a great day. Thank you, Thank you so much for your words. Uh, let me, before I introduce the FAO representative for Serbia, welcome the 108 participants to the webinar. Good morning, everybody. You will find uh, instruction for translation if needed at the beginning of the chat. Uh, log. Uh, now let me please give the floor to Mr. Nabil Gangi, the FAO representative for Serbia. Nabil, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob, distinguished partners, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Dobro uh, utro, buenos dias, bukertov, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and allow me to welcome you to this important webinar discussing one of the most challenging and still growing in achieving sustainable food production and food security, water and irrigation management. Uh, some three decades ago, as a freshly graduate engineer, I started my career working on introducing innovative approaches to rationalize water losses in irrigation systems in one of the oldest and most fertile agriculture spots on earth, which was then, and now even more, starting to see the effects of global climatic changes on its natural water supply. That's another reason why I am personally excited in, on, about our joint FAO EBRD work today. Though we all watched with interest the recent discoveries of water on the sunlit side of the moon, it would be some years before we can capitalize on this discovery to mitigate the climate change issues that are affecting our planet and the Western Balkan is no different. Climate scenarios and prognosis tells us that we will be facing lack of water in the times of the year when we most need it for agricultural production. On the other hand, some scenarios 
which we have been witnessing already over the last few years, warn of increasing extreme events and excessive rains in short periods, causing floods and heavy flash floods. In this regard, agriculture is very fragile. And if we can, if we do not act now, we will be witnessing a devastating, a devastating impact on food security, economy, and poverty. This tells us that water and irrigation management is a strategically important topic for the region, and I'm pleased that FAO has the opportunity to assist the government of Serbia in developing this sector. Indeed, in collaboration and looking at the experiences of some countries that have done a lot on this level. This is a continuation of decades old successful cooperation between FAO and the Republic of Serbia that will continue to grow. From a development and economy point of view, better developed irrigation systems will lead to increased yields and larger areas under high value crops such as fruits and vegetables. And Serbian agriculture will become more competitive. Serbian products and companies will be better established in current markets, opening doors to new markets around the world. Something which will have a positive impact not only on direct actors, but on economy and employment at a national level. However, this is a challenging task for the government and for us all. Knowing the complexity of irrigation development issues, as well as financial implications on national budgets. Having said that, I am confident the long-term result will justify the effort and investments. With this, I wish a successful continuation of the work of the government of Serbia, the EBRD, and the entire FAO team in the process of drafting and adopting the strategy. And this webinar is a first step of a series that will aim at transferring knowledge on irrigation technology management and governance to Serbian stakeholders. Thank you. Many thanks, Nabil, for your words. Mm -hmm. Now let me give the floor to Dr. Huara El Khouri, the Chief of Service for uh, the um, Europe, Central Asia, Near East, North Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean services. Wafa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to Thank you, Jacobo. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to everybody. And um, I'm happy to be with you and, and be opening and welcoming you to this webinar. Um, just to change from what the others have said, I would like to inform you a little bit more on what the investment center is and how we are cooperation with EBRD. So uh, just a couple of words. Um, actually, most of the countries, all of our countries are actually looking forward to achieve the uh, sustainable development goals and the 2030 uh, uh, sustainable development. To, to achieve those things um, and those targets, it's extremely important that um, uh, governments and, and investments are, are in place because they are the, <clears throat> the most important thing and uh, to, to be able to achieve that. And governments play a very, very important role in that, whether they are um, investing directly themselves or they are providing the enabling environment for the private sector to invest. And this is extremely important. Otherwise, without investments, there will be no achievement of the development goals. Uh, in, in, uh, in FAO, the investment center is actually the entry point to various investments and support to the countries, as well as the international financial institutes in uh, support to investments in the countries. The investment center plays uh, a three-way <clears throat> three partner, three partnership between FAO, the international financial institutes, institutions, as well as the governments. And we play uh, a role with many, many partners, including the World Bank, uh, IFAD, uh, the Green Climate Fund, uh, definitely EBRD as an important partner to us. Most of our partners in the IFIs are um, public sector support partners, uh, with the exception of EBRD. Uh, and of course, the Green Climate Fund, which is uh, on the climate, but also it's a public sector, mostly investment. 
However, um, it's important what, what we do in, in the investment center is actually um, support in the technical soundness of investments and in technically supporting the uh, implementation and the closure of the projects. So um, that's, that's one area. The other area is in capacity building, supporting the governments to be able to invest properly in a, in a good way, uh, in, including capacity building to certain things like uh, economic and financial analysis and social uh, responsibility uh, analysis. But we also do multi-stakeholder uh, policy dialogue, which is extremely important. We help the government uh, do this dialogue between the private and public sector so that investments are better uh, used and, and uh, expanded. We do uh, quite a lot of support in, in decision making, in uh, investment decision making for the governments. And actually, the most important, one of the important thing is the knowledge products, the sector analysis and studies. So um, we have been working with, with Serbia for many, many years, with EBRD specifically. And we've had very good and um, uh, uh, good investments and good successful stories. As, as millions, Milian said, that uh, mostly it was in the agribusiness uh, area, which was really good in quality assessments, uh, in Serbian quality labels, in the quality standards and geographic indications, but also in the area of uh, export promotion of and, and uh, supporting associations, both grain and horticulture. This is the first time that we work uh, with EBRD in, in Serbia in the public sector, and we're really excited in, in this uh, irrigation area of investments. Um, one thing just to tell you that uh, October for us is very important because it's, uh, it stands for the 75th anniversary of FAO which is really very uh, uh, exciting for us. But at the same time, it's very important for us because it stands for the 23rd um, uh, collaboration of FAO with EBRD. And that's something that we're very proud of because we've had very good, fruitful um, uh, activities in all the countries that are jointly FAO and EBRD member countries. I would really uh, like to um, welcome you to this webinar and uh, wish you a very successful um, meeting, especially with a very, very high caliber experts who are coming here to share with us their uh, activities and their experiences in, in successful irrigation systems, governance, technology, and, and the various ways of making it really work. So I really wish you all a, a very successful webinar and I'm looking forward to also to hear, uh, like you, all these new uh, uh, experiences. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Many thanks, Wafa. Many thanks, colleagues. We have now about 110 participants. Again, before we start the presentation, instruction for translation are included in chat at right at the beginning. So we are now moving the presentation parts. As we said at the beginning, we are going to have three speakers: Israel, Spain, and Portugal will share with us the presentation. Let me start with. The Israeli case study. Let me welcome uh, Mr. Ra'an Adin, who is the CEO and chairman of the Israeli Water Association and has over 30 years of experience in managing conditions related to irrigation technology um, and irrigation, of course, uh, technology. The presentation will last 20 minutes. Um, and right after presentation, we're going to have 10 minutes of question and uh, answers. Please, uh, Ran, the floor is yours for your presentation and good luck. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, please allow me to share the screen and, uh, and I will start. Uh, first of all, I want to take us 2,600 years to the past, to the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was going to prophesy about Egypt's fall, but before that, he was going to say how big and strong the Pharaoh is. And he was instructed to show his greatness as a, as a cedar in the Lebanon, uh, strong and high with thick branches. Water made it grow, groundwater made it tall, 
rivers flowed around it and sent its canals to all trees in the field. Therefore, it was higher than all trees and it had more branches and longer ones because of the abundance of water. So we see here two things. First of all, we see the connection between irrigation and uh, having strong and big trees. And another thing, we see the first uh, mention of irrigation where it sent its canals to all the trees in the field. Uh, that was probably the first uh, Israeli technology of irrigation in history. So thank you to the FAO, thank you to the BRD. Uh, uh, I welcome the, the audience from the Serbian government and the, and the professional public. I will show a case study of Israel or present what Israel's evolution of the water cycle was and how effective agriculture irrigation resulted from that. We'll start by talking about Israel's water stress, then show Israel's new water sources that are uh, solving this stress, uh, focus on governance, regulations, and standards in Israel, and talk about how all these generate agricultural resilience and growth. So Israel is a very small country in the Middle East. Uh, we're about 15% uh, of the uh, area of Serbia. Our climate is uh, semi-arid with uh, 500 millimeters of uh, precipitation per year. Most of it is in three months of the winter. Population growth is very challenging. Israel's population grew 12 times since its establishment in 1948. To show how fast that is, if Serbia's population had increased in the same rate since 1948, uh, can you guess how many people were in Serbia now? Well, 70 million. You would have to feed 70 million people. Uh, fortunately, only, only Israel uh, challenges that. Israel has one freshwater lake, the Sea of Galilee, in the northeast of Israel. It's far from the populated, uh, populated areas along the coast and the capital Jerusalem. We'll see about that later. So water availability, in general, fresh water availability is about 2 billion cubic meters per year. It's relatively stable, uh, expected to change, of course, with climate change. But always the demand, the increasing demand, will always suppress it and grow much faster than any availability. And that's, uh, I would say, the whole, uh, the whole challenge uh, in, in, in a few words. One more challenge that uh, you're familiar with is climate change. That climate change is hitting Israel a bit more. Temperature increase or the rate of temperature increase in Israel is about uh, one and a half times faster than the average temperature increase in the world. So all in all, uh, that's what we have. That's what we have to live with. And this water stress has been with us uh, for many decades. So let's see what we, what we do with this. Uh, what are the new water sources? Uh, first, I'll talk about water saving. Water saving, every drop counts, started even before the establishment in Israel. And it is uh, the most effective and the most cost effective a way to generate more available water. It's being taken in, in that aspect is Israel and considered almost as a water resource. By saving water, we make available more of all the other resources. Another resource is rainwater catchment. Uh, this shows uh, what's called the Menashe uh, River project. It's a project that collects water from four rivers simultaneously channels them to a pond, which is an infiltration pond, where the water is being stored as groundwater, because we don't need it when it rains, but it is stored as groundwater, and then pumped out and used by, by agriculture. Another uh, way to have more water is to take water from where it exists, the Sea of Galilee, to where it's needed. In the beginning, uh, decades of Israel, there was enough water for the uh, population from groundwater, but there wasn't enough water in the north part of the desert area of the Negev, which is the, in the south of Israel. So water was first taken from springs in the center of Israel to the south, and then pumped 
from the north of Israel to irrigate the desert. And so Israel is fighting desertification, and actually Israel's desert is shrinking with agriculture. What you don't see in the map here is that uh, this is, is 200 meters below sea level. So we need to overcome also a high defense, a very big, important uh, national project. Uh, and now all that had to do with uh, managing fresh water in a way, uh, when that's not enough and wastewater was becoming a problem, we started treating wastewater and treating them for reuse. This, this is the, uh, the and all, a very old picture of the Shafdan, the wastewater treatment plant treating uh, the main population, populated area in Israel in Tel Aviv area. And you see the, the uh, solar uh, uh, treatment ponds, which don't exist now. All this has been changed into more advanced facilities. And it, it treats water, all urban wastewater, to irrigation. Uh, in later years, tertiary treatment was added in, uh, in a unique form in Israel, which is uh, SET, soil aquifer treatment. In that methodology, water is applied on top of the ground. It infiltrates an area, a sandy area with clay and uh, silt. It goes through several months of uh, uh, filtration and is pumped out and sent to irrigation for agriculture. The results of that, we won't go into the details here, but the results are on the right. Uh, you will see the permitted uh, levels of, uh, uh, of the parameters for un unrestricted irrigation. And we see that all parameters are well within these standards. Uh, some of them uh, um, uh, deep, deep into the standard. Uh, what we don't have, and I'll just mention it uh, uh, shortly, are, are risks that we still have in wastewater because wastewater can include pollutants uh, such as uh, heavy metals, nanoparticles and pharmaceuticals. Some of them are already entering regulations, uh, not all of them yet. So the availability of this uh, marginal water, these uh, uh, non-freshwater resources can be shown in the last decades of water use by agriculture, where the green graph is the use of potable water by agriculture, which is continuously reducing. And the blue graph is the use of marginal water, mainly treated wastewater uh, by agriculture where uh, you can see that the total amount of water does not increase. Total amount of water used by agriculture does not increase, even though agriculture production does increase continuously. Additional water is still needed. Israel has been uh, using a cloud seeding or rain enhancement uh, by uh, flying and uh, dispensing silver iodine in, into the clouds when weather uh, is uh, appropriate for that. Uh, it has been shown to be to increase rain in up to 14%, which is a fantastic uh, present from the skies. And uh, the well-known uh, recent uh, addition to water is desalination, seawater desalination. Israel built five uh, large desalination plants of the largest in the world in 10 years, starting in 2003. And these supply now more than 60% of the drinking water uh, to urban areas in Israel. Uh, and in all that, we, we talked about the water quantity. What we need is to pay a lot of attention and uh, specifically with desalination to the water quality. When we remove the salts, we remove the minerals that we need, but also that the plants need. And we, we could by, uh, irrigating with desalinated water or with too much desalinated water, we could cause damage to agriculture that you see in the picture on, on the left or deterioration or deficiencies in important minerals and uh, also affect the ground by uh, increasing the, the SAR, the sodium absorption ratio, which is uh, dependent on calcium and magnesium ions. And, and with this, we need to be very careful. Currently, we are not irrigating directly with uh, desalinated water unless it is also mixed with other types of water. And these parameters 
are being uh, balanced for, for the safety of the agriculture pro products. So all in all, we, we get a, a relatively complex uh, map uh, of water management. We see the blue lines are potable water. The red lines are reused wastewater. The green lines, mainly in the south part, are saline water, which are also an important water source. And altogether, this needs to be managed with the new desalinated water uh, along the shore. And two more plants, the red ones, are being built in, in these coming years. And uh, that the role of the uh, water authority. All these uh, water resources with different qualities are available to agriculture. There is also a pricing system. Agriculture that uses potable water will pay more than agriculture using uh, marginal water, and it will pay different, uh, different prices for different qualities of that marginal water. The, the highest price is for using potable water in agriculture in locations where alternative water exists. And that, in a way, uh, motivates uh, the agriculture to use uh, these different uh, types of water. And, and today, there is a, a demand for, for, these, uh, for the reused water in agriculture more than there is to uh, potable water. Uh, overall, about uh, half of the agriculture, agriculture irrigation is supplied by reused wastewater. So in a way, if we try to generalize it, we see a, a complex uh, set of water uh, resources, water users. We must remember and give nature the status of a water resource and, and plan how it gets water and the type of water that it gets, preferably its own natural water. Regional uh, implications of uh, receiving water through uh, rivers across the border and giving water as well supplies potable water to its neighbors. Some of the water received is of uh, uh, poor quality and it is uh, uh, maintained and contained and, uh, and transferred to wastewater treatment plants and then it enters the re reused wastewater network. Uh, how do we manage all this? So uh, first of all, we need to remember Israel has a water law starting in the 50s all water resources are the property of the public. It's a very important law. And uh, I would say that without this law, uh, it would be very difficult to control what Israel does with water and irrigation. There was one preceding law that forces every supplied water to be metered, because without metered water, uh, it's meaningless to say that we are trying to manage it. A more recent law says that water will reflect its true cost, and assure effective use of water, and we saw part of that. Main institutions uh, related to water are the National Water Authority and the Ministry of Water Resources. The Ministry of Agriculture, which has re regulation, legislation, and guidance, will focus on that a bit more. Ministry of Health, which uh, regulates water quality and effluent quality. The National Water Company, which supplies on a national level uh, the national water carrier, and it also uh, built and maintains the national effluent or the big regional effluent carriers, and agricultural cooperatives who dis distribute uh, water among their uh, members. Just an example of how to handle uh, water. In case of drought, the water authority is in charge to forecast and uh, expect when drought is coming, warn us that drought is coming soon, declare it when it uh, reaches the parameters that are set for a uh, drought, and mitigate it uh, primarily by giving quotas to the various sectors, including the agriculture. The Ministry of Agriculture takes this quota and uh, gives it to the various cooperatives, manages it by giving each cooperative a quota. The, the cooperative made the, make the contributions within their members based on what they grow, what they grow, and uh, and how they grow it and irrigate it, and give that give the quotas within the cooperatives and leave the farm operators to manage their crops and irrigation based on that. 
some of the key roles of the Ministry of Agriculture Resource Institutes, and I will focus on that uh, in the next slide. Instructors, which uh, give professional guidance, but not only. Managing the irrigation uh, quotas, supporting the implementation of new technologies with the uh, uh, budgets and, uh, and of course, guidance. And uh, uh, supplying information, uh, such as research results, but also information on climate and and irrigation and uh, applications which give tools for optimal irrigation, for example, to farmers. Uh, more on agricultural resilience and, uh, and growth. Research, which is a, a key factor, research has been uh, started in Israel also. Research Institute started in Israel before its uh, establishment. Uh, uh, by the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, there are there is an, an a research organization which is uh, based in Vonkani Institute and additional research centers in the north and south of Israel, which are different, totally different climates. Uh, applied research is done with the private sector and there are many international collaborations. The instructions of the Ministry of Agriculture do not only advise on applying advanced agriculture, they also collect information from the field on the performance of the irrigation and the plantations, and they collect the needs and translate these needs into requirements for additional research and development. A very, very important role in the uh, com communication between the governance and the farmers, farmers in the field. There's more research done, of course, in universities by field R&D research institutes that collaborate with the Ministry of, of Agriculture. There is well Innovation of Authority, which funds uh, basic research, international collaborations, and the Israel Water Authority, which funds research in water, including research on uh, irrigation and the uh, relationship between water and uh, water of the agriculture and water resources. Uh, the main research topics which are handled by the uh, Agriculture uh, Chief Scientist Office is optimizing the use of water from various sources for irrigation. Uh, for example, is how to use uh, saline waters, uh, who can use saline water, what crops could be adapt adaptable to using saline water, uh, using uh, effectively using uh, reused water, and then prevention of polluting the water by agriculture activity, which is the Ministry of Agriculture protecting water resources for everyone practically intelligent uh, use of uh, various water qualities, agriculture use of soil additives, uh, including uh, sludge, which is an outcome of wastewater treatment, and development and impl implementation of decision support system and, and streamlining irrigation management and control, and that brings us also into digital uh, agriculture. There are various irrigation technologies. Uh, most of you are familiar with them, each with, with its different efficiency. Uh, an irrigation system is a complex combination of many technologies and many, uh, many advancements which are continuously done and continuous. They need to be considered when applying them and uh, trying to optimize. All in all, when irrigation technologies are used, uh, you can see in Israel that water use does not change while productivity of the agriculture is uh, continuously increasing. This is over decades. A few technologies, uh, a, a very simple technology, but complex in thinking of bringing water from a dew and from precipitation closer to the trunk of a tree. A sensor which is put inside the trunk of a tree based on research that, research that showed that stem water potential is uh, proportional to eventual fruit weight. And uh, this can be, actually it lets the tree say, I'm thirsty. Uh, hydroponic technologies, which allow uh, intensive growth of, uh, of, in this example, lettuce and greens with about 10th the amount of irrigation uh, of, normal, uh, of, of normal agriculture. Uh, robotics and uh, and AI and machine learning, which can be implemented with this uh, with this tool, in, even in greenhouses, small, compact, and autonomous. 
and taking all of this, this is something which is now uh, under development or taking all the various AI and digital technologies and information and big data into one coherent system and streamlining it into making everything uh, usable in one set of uh, common interfaces. This, I hope, uh, will be next year's case study uh, in, in next year's web webinar. So what have we learned? Uh, our, in Israel, our motivation for improving irrigation started with motor stress, but it also turned into economic growth by exporting uh, irrigation and water treatment technologies. When uh, looking at the water cycle holistically, a, very, a variety of new water resources can be developed. Special attention must be given to water quality. Governance, regulation and standards are critical, critical. I cannot repeat that more for effective implementation of advanced irrigation and optimizing this whole uh, irrigation agriculture uh, uh, sector. Research, de research development and implementation are an important role of the government. New irrigation technologies can improve agricultural resilience and growth and uh, digital technologies are expected to be the biggest contributor to agriculture growth in the near future. So thank you very much. You are welcome to visit Israel. This is one of the sites that uh, I will take you to visit when you are here and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Ronan, for this very uh, intense presentation with plenty of uh, data and uh, information. Let's now move to the question and answer side. I will, uh, if you allow me, uh, I will break the ice with a series of questions that we received via chat, other means, because at the beginning, for some technical reasons and apologies for this, the Q&A tool was not really working. Uh, I would start with the, if you could just give us very, very quickly a bit of info about the cost of water, depending on the type of, um, uh, depending, sorry, on uh, and how much it changes related to quality. And if you could highlight a bit the role of the water user association like yours or the cooperatives in the overall management. If you could really do this in one minute so that we can move then to the other questions that are in the Q&A box. Over to you, Ryan. Okay, sure. Uh, first of all, regarding the cost, uh, cost of water is proportional to its quality. Potable water is the highest and uh, a restricted irrigation is uh, the lowest. Saline water is also gradual, where low salinity water will be 20% um, more expensive than high salinity water. And low salinity water, some crops can use directly. So that allows a sort of balance between the supply and demand uh, in a way. Uh, the role of uh, Israel Water Association is uh, uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge dissipation with conferences seminars and courses, uh, sharing, uh, sharing information about water among the Israel water sector with irrigation and agriculture being a, a very large uh, portion of, of that uh, knowledge and of that uh, sharing. The agriculture cooperatives, uh, they could be a settlement, they could be a collection of farmers. Uh, what they do is they balance interests within the cooperative where each farmer uh, could have a totally different crop, uh, use totally different technologies and uh, management practices. And they, they balance water. Uh, first of all, they manage the water. They are allowed, for example, to, to store water. Uh, they manage water resources which are related to their uh, region. They can uh, uh, purchase water from various uh, water suppliers. And when they are received the quota, which is uh, below the demand, they look at uh, which farmer uh, could sustain with less water and which could not. If you have a, a short-term crop, you could possibly skip one crop and continue later. While if you have a plantation of trees, then uh, avoiding irrigation or reducing irrigation could have an impact for 
months or years beyond that uh, period of drought. So they, they do this uh, cost-effective agriculture, agronomic uh, thinking together in collaboration in order to optimize their use. Ryan, just a follow-up question. When you talk about the cost of water, are you talking about the tariff or the cost uh, to supply the water? Um, does these two equal? I mean, the tariff that the farmers pay at the end of the pipe, does it equal the cost of supplying this water or there is a share of subsidies or any other sort of, let's say, public or other sort of um, support? Well, I would say a yes and no. Right. Uh, the, the water, uh, the ho all of the water in Israel, the, the cost of the whole water sector in Israel is financed by all the water users, uh, regardless of location, regardless of how much effort it took to generate water for a specific user. Agriculture is paying less for potable water and uh, uh, it, it is in a way subsidized by the rest of the market. But if, if I look at myself as a user, yeah, I can uh, explain it by having that part of the cost of the agricultural product that I eventually buy in the supermarket. So this, this cycle, in some ways, it does close uh, even outside the economy of the water sector. Uh, I would say that reused water is priced more accurately However, part of the reuse of the water is the treatment of the wastewater and the initial treatment of the wastewater is funded by the water user. Because if we take a reuse out of the equation, we still need to treat the water, still need to treat it for recharge, for, for, for discharge, for example. So uh, the main users of the water pay for the water and for their uh, initial treatment. And the farmers eventually pay for the more advanced treatment and reuse of their specific types of water. Right, thank you very much. Let me move to another question from one of our uh, attendees. Uh, can the development of irrigation infrastructure be improved by increasing the price of irrigation water? I mean, how the two works? I mean, can you please just let us know your, your thoughts about it? Well, well, definitely uh, infrastructure is important. Uh, in, in some countries in the world, precipitation used to be uh, a sole resource of uh, irrigation, but climate change is forcing nations to invest in national infrastructure for irrigation. Uh, through closing, what Israel did is it closed the, uh, the water sector economically. Meaning now, if we want to have a, an infrastructure project, we need to see how to fund it. We can fund it by taking loans or by PPP or uh, BOT, build operate transfer projects, as we did with the desalination plants. We can manage the same for large irrigation projects, which means building expensive infrastructure and spreading the expense over a long period of time. I believe that EBRD and FAO are doing very similar uh, projects with, with funding uh, or, or loans. I've seen that uh, around the world with, uh, with many organizations. So increasing the funding is essential. How to do it in a reasonable way, not but just pouring money, but by looking at the long-term impact and the long-term value of that water and how it will uh, increase agriculture, a more logical financial or, or or comprehensive financial consideration can be made. All right, thank you very much. Let me let me also ask you a question related to ancillary infrastructure. Uh, if you could quickly answer, I mean, like how energy needs are balanced for the water sector in Israel, because it seems from what you presented us that also the energy needs and requirements are substantial. And I think it's a good point to understand this uh, nexus between irrigation and availability of good, I mean, cheap energy, or at least at a subsidized price. Over to you. Well, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, energy, the energy of, of the water or bringing the water to the field is part of the cost of the water. 
So uh, it's easy to see it in a desalination plant, but also when you transport water over a hundred kilometers or transport it from uh, the sea to the mountains of Jerusalem, the energy for transporting the water, the energy for treating the water, for treating the wastewater and making them reuse reusable is, is all embedded in the, in the cost of the water. The additional water needed uh, for the farming, uh, for irrigation exists, exists, but it's not, it's not as much. You, you may need uh, uh, pumping, you may need to increase pressure. Of course, you need to operate the systems themselves. But I would say that the major expense is already included in the water price. Thank you very much, Han. One very last question uh, related to digital, sorry, related to technology. And at which level of irrigation networks do you find technology is currently contributing the most? And where do you see the biggest potential for the future? And please, when, when you think about the future, think, think also in terms of global challenges such as climate change and others. Over to you, Renan, for like really one good answer, please. Okay. I'll try to do it in 59 seconds. Okay. <laughs> but I would say that, that the, uh, the fundamental, uh, found the, the fu foundation of a fundamental issue in uh, implementing technology and digital technology is uh, sensors. Having sensors uh, giving us real time uh, measurement of water quantity and water quality in the irrigation systems, in the fields, in the trees, in the plants, and in the air, as we saw. Once we will have this, everything else is building blocks on top of that. Uh, of course, bi-directional communication that allows us to add, reduce fertilizers, open, close valves is, is also contributing. Uh, I would say that uh, the most important and the most valuable is spreading as many sensors as possible in, and giving real-time uh, data uh, to the users and to the managers. Perfect. Thanks so much, Van. Uh, if we, I mean, I will just uh, move the next presentation. Uh, let me first thank again Anan for his contribution. Remember, questions could be either in the Q&A tool below or a chat. Now that the Q&A works, please, I would appreciate if you could use this. It makes my life much, much easier. Now, let me introduce you Maculata Brodominguez. She is an agriculture engineer working at the Ministry of Agriculture, Fishery and Food for the Government of Spain. Welcome in Macolada. In Macolada, specialized and work in irrigation transformation and modernization of investment projects. We do believe this is extremely active for Serbia um, as well. We have seen with Israel a situation of high water stress which combining demography and climate change could also be the case of countries like Serbia that exposes of much higher amount of water. But in a business as usual scenario, this could be the very near future. Let's look now at Spain. Immaculada, your, the floor is yours. Please feel free to share the screen and show the, uh, your presentation. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. I have some problems. I don't know if you can see my screen. Jacopo? 
Yes, I can see the screen. I only see a web, a PDF um, web page, and I see your mouse moving. Okay, now it moves. Only, only the mouse. You can see the. Can no, you see, see the? Not very well. Not in the presentation mode. But, uh, okay. okay. In the text mode. I'll try to to solve the problem. Excuse me. Sorry, I try to, to do the presentation in this mode. I hope everything is okay, more or less. Makula, if you prefer, I can also run your presentation the way you prefer. Excuse me, I can't hear very well. Can you tell me? Can you repeat, Jacopo? Yeah, can you hear Sorry? Please start. Okay. I'm going. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience of the presentation, uh, but uh, today is a, a bad day <laughs> because I, I can uh, get a, a better room for this presentation. Excuse me. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this webinar on irrigation networks development and management. This is a pleasure for me to be here to present the case of irrigation in Spain. I work for the Spanish Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. Within the ministry, I work specifically in the Subdirectorate of Irrigation, Natural Roads and Rural Infrastructures. I'm going to explain the Spanish irrigation policy. We have intensively worked in the last 20 years in the process of modernization irrigation systems to be adapted to the effects of climate change and related to the reduced availability of water. I'm going to present the Spanish irrigation in three sections. First, I'm going to explain which are the published organisms involved in the management of water in Spain. Second, I will make a picture of the current situation of the irrigated agriculture. And third, I summed the irrigation modernization process that we have followed. In Spain, water management is carried out among two ministries, Ministries for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge, and the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fishery, and 17 local, excuse me, local governments. Each of public administration, government and regional, has some assigned competencies, as you can see in the slide. The Ministry for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge to the, water, to the General Water Directorate is in charge of water management or the execution of manage, management of dams, the water transport channels, the water concession for irrigation, and the hydrological planning. Immaculada, Immaculada sorry, apologies, sorry to interrupt you. Can you just put the slide a bit more central in the in the screen because we only see three quarters of it and we, we would like to miss any important information. Maybe you can reduce the overall uh, size of the page and uh, okay perfect or you just move during the presentation otherwise we lose info. Over to you, thank you, sorry. Okay, excuse me. As I said, uh, you can see in the slide the Ministry for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge through General Water Directorate uh, do the water management through execution and management of dams, water transport channels, water concession for irrigation and hydrological planning. 
On the other hand, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food, and the local governments are in charge of the irrigation. They made the execution of pipes distribution within irrigated areas. This map shows the distribution of rainfall in Spain. The distribution of rainfall in our country is irregular both in time and in the territory. This irregularity is being aggravated by the effects of climate change. The range of rainfall varies from more than 2,000 mm in the northern regions to less than 150 mm of rainfall per year in the Mediterranean arc. In this map, in green, the irrigated area are marked with as can be seen coincide with the yellow area, which are those with the least precipitation. This situation is the main reason why in Spain irrigated agriculture is so important. Spain is the first country in the European Union according to the irrigated area. These are the figures. There are almost 4 million hectares, which represent 22% of the utilized agricultural area and 65% of the final land production, that is the pilot of the agri-food industry. The advantages of irrigated agriculture in a country like Spain, eminently agriculture and at the same time with an irregular distribution of precipitation territorial and for the year are multiple. On the one hand, there are economical advantages. For example, one hectare of irrigation produces six times more than one non-irrigated area. The farmer's income is four times higher than of rainfed agriculture and it constitutes a pillar of the agri-food industry. Income diversification allows greater crop rotation also. On the other hand, there are social benefits. It allows the population to settle in rural areas thanks to the improvement of the quality of life and the creation of direct and indirect employment, tripling the number of jobs generated by rainfit agriculture. And finally, there are also environmental advantages. Irrigation prevents land abandonment erosion and desertification, preserving the landscape and historical heritage. Mrs. Inmaculada, if I may just for a second, could you try please pressing the fourth button in your second line? That should help us seeing the whole presentation. Some problem because the, the room is very big and I don't have enough, uh, I don't know how to say, for producing the, the mouse. I have some problems. And... No, if possible, if not, no worries. I mean. it's, it's, it's very complicated because I don't know. Can you see the, the presentation already like this? Well, the, the thing is that we cannot see the whole slide actually. And then when you are changing slides, we cannot follow, we are missing parts of the slides. But if not possible, don't, don't bother with this, just proceed as it is, no, no worries. Sorry, I can't, sorry that I can't do anything. I don't know how to, how to solve the problem, excuse me. If I have some minutes, I can, I can solve it. Okay, yeah. Please, let, let's proceed. Don't worry. Important is what you are saying. Uh, don't worry about it. Let's just don't proceed. worry. Don't worry. Let's, let's, let's continue, please. And thank you so much. 
Excuse me. Within the following three slides, I will show the current situation of irrigated agriculture in numbers. The main source of water supply for irrigation is surface water, which account for 68%, followed by crown water, 26%. In Spain, more and more about the consequences of climate change, other unconventional water sources are used. Water for, from wastewater treatment plants, 1.6%, or desalinated, 0.6%. The main irrigation system is drip irrigation, 53%. Followed by a sprinkler irrigation and gravity irrigation, which are used roughly in the same proportion. On the slide, you can see the evolution of the irrigation system over the last. 20 years as a result of the joint effort of public administration, general and regional and irrigators. All of them have worked to have a sustainable irrigated agriculture from an environmental point of view, implementing better technology for the efficiency use of water and energy. In Spain, in absolute terms, cereal is the crop with the largest irrigated area, almost 1 million hectares, followed by olive groves, over 800,000 hectares, and vineyards, nearly 400,000 hectares. However, in relative terms, almost all the citrus and vegetable cultivated area is irrigated. Depending on the irrigation system used in each crop group, we have the following. Gravity irrigation is mainly used for irrigating cereals and fodder, as well as in home gardens. Sprinkler irrigation is distinguished mainly in tubers, legumes, industrial products, and cereals. And drip irrigation is the majority system in fruit trees, citrus, and no citrus fruit trees. Among these crops, the olive crops and vineyards are watered almost exclusively with drip irrigation. In the case of vegetable, even if they are mostly watered with the drip irrigation system, 56%, which include the greenhouse area, other irrigation systems are also important in this group of crops. To get all the numbers that I have already shown in this presentation, there has been a great process of modernization of Spanish irrigation. Over the last 20 years, in terms of, of infrastructure, thanks to the effort of public administration and irrigator, it was possible to modernize 1.5 million hectares with an investment of three 3,000 million euros from the public administration concern. The result has been more technical irrigation areas in which new technologies have been incorporated, resulting in irrigation better prepared for the challenges of the future. From an environmental point of view, these are more sustainable irrigation because they use less water, fertilizer, and phytosanitary products. And from a social point of view, they allow the creation of best quality jobs in the rural areas. These irrigation modernization plans have resulted in a significant decrease in the water consumed in agriculture.
In the next three slides, I would like to explain the irrigation policy in Spain, which is based on three main actions. The most important is action in infrastructures. I mean, this action to modernize and irrigate this infrastructure, we find increasing water storage capacity by constructing prefabricated basin or reservoir, construction of pumping station, filtering station, and electrical networks to give pressure to the irrigation network to increase energy efficiency and to improve water quality. Action on the water transport and distribution network to improve water management, to reduce water losses in water transport and distribution, and to adapt infrastructure to allow the application of more efficient irrigation system. Introduction of other water resources, recycled water, desalinated water. The use of recycled and desalinated water in agriculture reduce the pressure on natural source of water, allowing its release for other uses. The automation of irrigation system by remote control will facilitate management. Technological advances introduced in irrigation systems as a automation, communication, and computing allow the establishment of remote control systems that facilitate the management of irrigation. These technological innovations are included in the action of irrigation modernization, allowing other things, the improvement and optimization of water management. And finally, action to improve energy efficiency in operation of or using alternative energies. Guaranteeing high energy efficiency in irrigation is a priority to ensure the sustainability of the activity in terms of the use of resource and the economic viability of irrigated agriculture. Alternative energy in irrigation projects is used whenever the technical requirement allows. All irrigation modernization projects are carried out in coordination with the Water Management Authority in Spain, which is the Ministry of Ecological Transition, in compliance with European and national regulation. And I want to highlight that before we carry out the modernization of farm irrigation infrastructure, we must have a permit from the ministry related to the ability to the availability of water in the basin and the environmental assessment. The second type of action in the irrigation policy is technical advice to irrigators. To strengthen this type of action, the Ministry has invested in a thematic information system for irrigation CR. This represents a network of 464 agroclimatic stations located in the main irrigation area. Information collected by this network of stations is available free of charge to irrigators via the website of the Ministry of Agriculture and from the SIAR application for Android. Through the application, irrigators can have an estimate of the crops irrigator need, taking into account the climate condition and the determined crops. On the other hand, we also have the National Center for Irrigation Technology, where the Central Laboratory for Testing Irrigation Materials and Equipment is located. This place supports the sector by collaborating with manufacturers and users in the development of test methods in the characterization of equipment and in the study of the behavior of material and design prototypes. At the regional level, there, are, there is an advisory service for irrigation. There are technicians who inform farmers about technical and environmental issues related to irrigation. To irrigation. The irrigation policy, in addition to its performance in infrastructure and advice to the sector, also adds in other important aspects that contribute to better management of irrigation, 
water through innovation and training of irrigators related to innovation. In the project of the Ministry for the Improvement of Irrigation Infrastructures, the best sustainable technology available happened was being considered and used in relation to the optimal design of the related network, the use of the latest technology in irrigation elements and material to be used, installation of the remote control in modernized infrastructures, the use of renewable energies when technology has made it possible, and the use of unconventional waters where the availability of the resource is very limited. To promote innovation, the Ministry, through the NAP National Rural Development Program financed by the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development subsidized the execution of innovate, innovative irrigation projects among others. And in relation to training, 10 technical training days per year are included in the containing training plan for rural technicians of the General Directorate of Rural Development of this ministry. They deal with technical and regulatory issues related to irrigation, thus acting the ministry as a transmitter of knowledge to the sector. In the past, when there was not so much training information available, the ministry organized a one-year master to train technicians who related work on the maintenance and management of the infrastructure that the state was building. And finally, I would like uh, to present in the last two slides other entities involved in irrigation policy that are not public administration, say as Antraxa, which are public companies that help to carry out the irrigation policy. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food has an agreement with the public company Seyasa for carrying out the modernization of irrigation infrastructure. Seyasa belongs to the State Heritage Group, the Ministry of Finance and Civil Service of Spain, and is, in, is an instrumental company of the Ministry of Agriculture to this General Directorate for the modernization of irrigation envisioned in the National Irrigation Plan and declared of general interest. The Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food has an agreement also with the public company Traxa for carrying out other issues related with the irrigation policy as the reduction of projects of painted transformation to irrigated areas, research or development of applied schools like SIA. And finally, but very important, but very important uh, also the users who in Spain are organized in irrigation communities. 65% of the water resources available are demanded by the irrigation sector. Um, it is mandatory by law that water users that serve the same outlet of contention shall come together to form users' community. When the water is used only for irrigation, these communities are then called irrigators' communities. These irrigator communities are public law corporations attached to basin organization. The majority of the irrigation in Spain is integrated into these communities, which play a fundamental role in regarding the good use and management of water with the aim of quarantine the water demand is equitable for all users. Out of a total of almost 3,800,000 hectares of irrigated area in Spain, more than 2.5 million hectares are managed by 7,186 irrigated communities. There are some future This is the gravity on final drip irrigation that this is the method of irrigation that we use uh, in 53% of the total area irrigated. And there are some other issues of the some dams and sand station 
of pumping. Thank you for your attention. I am sorry for the, the problem, the technician problem. I hope uh, this presentation uh, is useful for all the, the, the people who is connected. And excuse me for, for this. Immaculada, many, many thanks. Don't worry about the technical issues. Very interesting presentation. I was very impressed to, to discover the gigantic social engineering that was built on the irrigation and how much the soft investment plays um, a crucial role in making the investment in infrastructure effective. My understanding, and move to the question immediately, is that we can't only think in terms of cubic meters of concrete and volumes of water transported from A to B, but we really need to carefully look into the social engineering and into the economic engineering of the process. We do have a series of questions. Let's start with some technical questions, which I, I kindly ask you to answer very quickly. One comes from uh, Ismail uh, Uda and is asking, what is the role of private investment in the modernization effort, so not just in the initial construction, but also in the moving forward of the irrigation theme in Spain. Over to you for a very quick answer. The, public, the private company um, are the, the companies that uh, made effectively all the infrastructure. The process is that the government uh, has a process to, to select which company made the project according to the, the budget uh, presented. It's a kind of contest that the government uh, published and in this contest, different companies apply uh, to, to do this, this, this uh, infrastructure uh, depending on the technical uh, question and in, in the economical issue is selected one company or other company. Many, many thanks, Immaculada. Uh, just a connect question from our colleague Zoran Knezic. Uh, what is, I mean, does the price of water depend on the quality of water? Similar question we had with our colleague from Israel. Are the two related and who decides, basically? What is the governance beneath this decision and this pricing, because it seems to me that, again, pricing water, so just not giving water, but pricing water, is another key element of uh, successful, successful irrigation networks. Over to you, Immaculata, brief question, uh, answer. Uh, the price is the, the, the main point in Spain, is a big, big question. Uh, the, pre the price of the uh, surface uh, water or ground, wa uh, ground, wa ground water is uh, mm, depending on the basin, uh, it depending on the quantity of water the basin has and is managed by the uh, Ministry of Ecological Transition. As I saw in the first presentation, the, the, all uh, the subject related with the, the price, uh, uh, how to distribute the water, and uh, all the management of water indeed is a competence of the Ministry of the Transitional, the Ecological Transitional of, of Spain. It's, it's the Ministry of Environmental Issues or something like that in, in other countries. And uh, in, in case of um, the, 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 the important source of water in Spain, surface and groundwater, this is a competence of this ministry and it depends on the basin. There are rivers on the north that where the, the, the quantity of water is not a problem and um, probably the, the price of the water is lower than the south where the basin has not enough water for all the user and probably the price is higher. And it's different from the price of uh, a desalinated water or a recycled water. In this case, the price is uh, the, the, the price that 
is put by the, the, the company that is to the, this desalinated water or this uh, recycling water. And this is the main issue because uh, all, all of farmers want to have a water for surface but not use the, 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 the water for recycled or desalinated because it's very high, the price in Spain. I see. Thank you very much. And indeed, we, we keep going into the same issue of price water and again, uh, not just technology, digital or not, but management, soft, in, I mean, soft infrastructure and so forth and so on. Let me ask you uh, one last question from uh, Serbia. They are asking if irrigation if the irrigation of cereals taking water away from higher value crops is, I mean, is irrigation of cereals taking water away from higher value crops? And if somehow at your level, you're trying to address uh, this, over to you, uh, Ibrahim. The, the irrigation of cereal is, uh, is not it's compulsory in some part of Spain because we don't have enough water. And in this part, um, uh, because of the consequences of climate change, um, we have to use this, uh, this kind of irrigation in Syria that is normally there are a crops. Uh, there is a crop that no need uh, water, but in Spain, because of the climate change, we have to, to regain cereal, and apart from that, the production is higher. We use this, this type of irrigation in Syria, mainly in the northern part of Spain, where um, for us, the water is not a limitation. And we, we use this for obtaining a higher uh, productivity of these kind of crops and in some cases because of the consequences of the climate change. All right, thank you very much, Immaculada. Just a brief reminder at the end of the webinar, we will uh, send an email to all participants with a series of you know, brief answers to all the questions that have not been answered during the, the, the webinar due to time constraint. Let me now uh, briefly uh, thank Immaculada for her presentation, for showing the complexity of mixing, making functional the, 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 the soft and the hard infrastructure and how there is clear need for both institutions, private sector and other and all the involved actors to be at the same table and work to make the system working. Uh, now the floor goes to Mr. Jose Pedro Salena, is the CEO and chairman of EDA, EDA, a Portuguese public company that response that is responsible for managing uh, the Alcaveda Alcaveda sorry uh, project that provides a series of services such as hydropower generation, water distribution, and of course irrigation to over 120,000 hectares. Jose Pedro, many thanks for joining us. The floor is yours. Please feel free to share your screen. Over to you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Is, is my screen on, Jacobo? Not yet. When we wait for the screen to be shared, let me also remind you that this webinar, of course, is recorded and you will receive with the answer, the unanswered question, the link as well as the presentations. Over to you, uh, Jose Pedro, we see the screen, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to uh, speak a little bit about the Alkiva project. Uh, the correct way to say is Alkiva. So in fact, um, uh, it is, uh, my presentation will be a little bit different from my colleagues. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, one project, not about the, the whole country. And um, just to, uh, a little bit about on the history and how we, come to, we came to uh, put in place this, this project in the south of Portugal. Uh, so it all uh, starts with the, sorry. 
Okay, it all starts with um, the Arkiva Dam. It is this image. Uh, so we, we constructed the Arkiva Dam in the Guadiana. And with this, we created uh, Europe's larger, largest uh, man-made lake uh, in volume and in, in surface. So in fact, it, it can, it, its capacity uh, can hold uh, around 4.2 billion cubic meters of water. Um, just to put that into perspective, uh, that's roughly the same volume as Portugal uses around the one year. So the whole of Portugal, all the population, all the agriculture, all the industry of Portugal uses roughly around 4 billion cubic meters of water a year. Uh, um, this uh, this uh, river that we are uh, um, capturing water from is the Guadiana. Uh, it is an international river that flows from Spain and most of its basin is in fact, its watershed is in fact in Spain. And, and so we had an, 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 a very sensitive issue uh, to uh, construct this because we had to come to an agreement with Spain uh, in order to have uh, minimum flows and guarantee the, the success of all these projects. Um, Irregularity uh, and, and climate change is not a new thing for us. Uh, it's around the globe, but here in the Mediterranean climate is very dramatic. Uh, this uh, graphic that I, I am showing is the, the, the annual rainfall in Beja, the, uh, the city in the middle of our irrigation perimeter since 1941. So as you can see, uh, total uh, rainfall ranges between uh, in a very good year, more than a thousand millimeters uh, to, uh, in a bad year, around 300. So we range from desert precipitation to a very good precipitation. Uh, and and it's, it has been going like that for forever since we, in fact, have records. Uh, also to put into perspective with our Serbian friends, um, this is the, 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 the normal climate in Beja on, on your left and in uh, Belgrade, Serbia on your right. So uh, as you can see in the same, same scale, so the bars is uh, monthly precipitation and the lines, the, min, the blue line is the, the average of the minimum temperature and the red is the average of the maximum temperature. So as you can see, uh, the temperatures go way higher in, in, in Portugal and when they do, when the temperatures go up, it doesn't rain at all. So in the summer here, it doesn't rain at all. So when plants need and have the conditions to grow and reach their full potential, nature does not provide the water for them. So uh, here, irrigation is crucial to have uh, sustainable agriculture. Uh, in, the, in the very uh, near past, we had this kind of scenario uh, in our region. So this is one water intake for a dam in our system that uh, in 2005 was like this. So only 15 years ago was like this. So here in the bottom is the, the lowest water intake. As you can see, it's completely dry. So in this year, for, for, for sure, there was no irrigation. There, there was, it was not possible to irrigate any areas. So a few, um, a few major milestones and, and a time a timeline, uh, just to tell you a little bit about the, the history of the, the last uh, years here. So we had, we reached a, a, um, an agreement with Spain regarding the international rivers in 1968. So we have five rivers that flow from Spain into Portugal and we had to come to an agreement with Spain. Uh, and so we had to divide the, the international uh, portions of the river uh, for each country. And for Portugal, this, the, the part that's upstream from the dam was uh, dedicated to Portugal. This is why we were able to, um, to build the Alqueva Dam. We started constructing it in the in 1970, um, and we, we did the primary uh, foundation and um, uh, wall to divert the river. But then we had in 1974 we had the revolution in Portugal, 
and for 20 years uh, the construction was completely uh, paused so we the, we just resumed it in 1996 uh, so then we're is really when the construction starts and gates closed in 2002 for the dam uh, after that uh, the, the the dam filled up very quickly and uh, we started distributing water in 19, in 2009 uh, and uh, we concluded our first phase uh, only four years ago in uh, 2016. In this year, we're starting second, the second stage, the second phase of the infrastructure of this project. What we have witnessed is a, a major change in our landscape, in, our, in the, the color of our landscape and in the crops that we are seeing. Uh, this picture is for olives, which is our first crop. It has, uh, this project has has revolutionized completely the, the olive production in Portugal and the olive oil production in Portugal because um, we have very uh, productive olive groves here and um, we, we are traditionally, uh, we were importing olive oil and now Portugal is already a net exporter of olive oil uh, with uh, around 70,000 hectares of modern and irrigated olives, now we almost double the production of Portugal. Almonds is also the, the, a very important crop and in very recent years, in the last five years, it started and now we already have almost 15,000 hectares of modern almond growth. And it will be also a second revolution. For sure, we will double production for Portugal. Uh, fruit and uh, horticultural crops also, this is pears, but apples, uh, um, oranges, peaches, the, the, we're, seeing, we're seeing a lot of new crops, completely new in this region, and also horticulture like tomatoes, onions, uh, uh, pumpkin, uh, a lot of crops that were completely impossible without the uh, guaranteed water supply that the dam can provide. This is uh, the, our history of um, annual irrigated areas. So uh, as you see, it's been steadily, steadily going up. Uh, so it just in, in seven years, we almost tripled the irrigated area. Uh, and the annual distributed volume, of course, followed that, that, uh, that trend. Uh, um, but uh, of course, uh, we have to account for climate. So, you may ask why in 2018 did we uh, distribute so little water? It's because we had a very uh, moisture, uh, a very rainy uh, spring. So it rained a lot and the summer was not so hot. That's why the, the distributed water was, was not so high. Uh, um, the, the, our, our distributed, uh, our crops, the crops that were irrigating on the region, Oh, I'm sorry, this is not translated, it's in Portuguese, but the green large portion is the olives, so the big, big, big chunk of the area is olives. The second one is almonds, the third is uh, maize, corn, and the, uh, the fourth here is vineyards. And then a lot of different crops uh, with a smaller percentage. Uh, the, these new crops that we are seeing, um, are all new projects is one thing that it's a really advantage for for this this project it's everything is new the infrastructure is new so it uses the latest technology but also the the if the farmers the the farmers and the projects that are using the water are also new um, farmer not not new farmers but new farmers with this with this kind of uh, using with using the water so, um, like normal, uh, like it is normal, um, they are using the, the current technology, latest technology. So the use of um, weather, weather data, for example, this is a weather station. This is completely, um, uh, it's not rare. It's everyone has a weather station. Everyone has moisture probes in the soil. 
uh, everyone uses drip irrigation. So everyone uses the technology that's available, uh, easily available in the 21st century, because most of the projects are less than five years old. So they're using the technology that is available right now. With this and also with the, the, the crop choices that the, the farmers made, we have been uh, witnessing an average water consumption per hectare really below our ex expectations uh, 20 years ago. So um, we, we, can we are average, uh, averaging around 3,000 cubic meters per, per hectare, which is 300, 300 millimeters of actual uh, uh, irrigation, um, which is much less than we were anticipating. Of course, from our, uh, from the operator point of view, also latest tech, the latest technology is in use. Um, and, and so, for example, we, we, we use a lot of Israeli technology. All the hydrants are from Israel. Um, this is uh, one of our control stations. So it's, as you can see, it's uh, pretty modern uh, and it uses all the remote, remote uh, sensing, remote probes, um, in, in, intelligent software to manage the network. And as a result of this, so uh, efficient water use on the farmer side, efficient water use on the distribution side, we can uh, think of um, starting a, a second phase of irrigation area with using the same water that was um, planned to use uh, 30 years ago. So accounting for the inflows in the river, accounting for um, climate change that probably reduced those inflows, inflows by 15 or 20% in 100 years, um, we, can, uh, we, are, we are confident to increase our irrigated area by 50,000 hectares. And that, of course, brings a lot of uh, interesting uh, benefits for society because we will increase the gross value added uh, and create new jobs. And uh, we already have um, the funding for this with loans uh, with the European Investment Bank and the Council of Europe Bank. Um, and construction is already has already started. So, in fact, we have four areas already under construction right now. This is our, um, the green uh, area is the, the irrigated area right now under um, operation right now. And now the, the orange areas that are now showing uh, are the areas that will be, we will be expanding. So, in fact, we are using the, the primary network, the older, the infrastructure that was already in place. We are, we are trying to, to find where we have surplus capacity and use that surplus capacity to extend the, the, our network to areas where there are no environmental issues, there are, uh, there are um, uh, farmers that are interesting and willing to use the water and, and want to do so, and, and um, with the, we'll have a, a very interesting uh, increase in their, in their turnover. This is uh, our headquarters in Beja. Uh, just to tell you a little bit that uh, the option of the Portuguese state was also to create uh, a public company with this mi specific mission. Uh, we were, we are, I think, more agile than a state department in um, proper uh, planning and implementing all the, the construction that is needed and also in managing everything. So we are now um, responsible for man managing the water from its very beginning to uh, to the client. So we are responsible for harvest, for capturing water, for pumping, for distributing, and for uh, getting it over to our clients. Um, an important topic for us is that um, we do not have Mr. Newton as an ally. So, um, in fact, most of the irrigation perimeters uh, or a lot of irrigation perimeters around the world and in Portugal, they rely on a dam that is at the higher ground than the, the irrigation fields. In, in Alkiva is in fact the opposite. So the, the, the water level at Alkiva is lower than the irrigated fields. 
So we have to start by pumping it. Uh, that requires a lot of water. This is a picture of our pumping station, our largest pumping station that um, uh, just to give you a number, if it's running at, at full power, in the, the energy bill at this site is 4 million euros a month. Uh, so uh, you can imagine the amount of energy that it requires. Um, and uh, we want to, um, we don't want to be dependent on the, the energy price. We want to produce our own electricity. And this is why we are investing heavily on um, floating solar. Floating solar is a very interesting technology for us because every time you have a pumping station, you have a water, we, you have water next to it. Um, here, for sure, because we use, re rely only on surface water. Um, and it's very interesting to put the production, energy production next to consumption. You don't have losses and you don't have, of course, you're, you are not using um, areas that will be, would be very interesting either for forest or for, for um, agriculture. Uh, so this is our floating solar project uh, um, that will put 10 floating solar plants next to the primary pumping stations with a total power of uh, 55 megawatts and uh, also we have an approved loan from the Bank of the Council of Europe for 45 million. Just to finish up with two topics, uh, to, to tell you that um, this project is a multi-purpose project, but also uh, as it was made so recently, all the, the, the worries about the society regarding the environment were taken into account. Uh, for example, this is uh, our fish elevator, uh, which is, I think, rather unique uh, because, well, the environmentalists and the biologists that studied this issue said, well, you're creating a dam, you're creating a barrier in the, reef, in the river, so the fish cannot uh, go from where they want. Uh, and some fish, they want to go upstream and lay their eggs upstream. And uh, with this 45 meter, 45 meter a dam or concrete wall, it would be impossible for them for, 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 to overcome that obstacle. So the engineers came up with this solution. We attract the fish here by letting the water in through a cage, which is in fact a fish trap. They go in here, they land up in the cage, and then once an hour, this goes up, goes sideways, goes down, and let the fish up. And so we have measured the efficiency of this, and it's, it's, it's working like perfection, really. Another, another issue for, for us that's really important is that we are, we are attracting biodiversity. This is a flock of flamingos that would be impossible for us to see without uh, creating all this uh, set of dams, not just one dam, but a lot of water plants that we have in our system, over 70 water dam, water plants that are attracting aquatic birds like, like the flamingo. So it's very interesting for us to preserve uh, the environment and also to, to see the increase in biodiversity in the region with water. Another uh, topic, just to finish, is that we had to dig a lot. We had to dig a lot. We had to dig almost 2,000 kilometers to lay our pipes to reach uh, the, the farmers. And, and while digging, we discover a lot of things. We, we discovered, in fact, more than 2,000 archaeological sites. All of them were studied, identified, cataloged, and we found out uh, um, pieces like this one that is over 5,000 years old. And of, of course, you can imagine the civil engineers during construction, for them, the, archae the archaeologists were like the enemy because they were uh, putting all these uh, difficulties into uh, the advance of the construction. But uh, since we, we have overcome that, uh, it's uh, now uh, um, a matter of pride for us to have contributed so much to, to knowledge and to preserve so much uh, cultural heritage from the past. So um, thank you very much for your attention. This is our logo, our way to show you that uh, we are joining, uh, we're putting together the sun and the water, creating green and create, creating
creating a fresh new land. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Jose Pedro. It was extremely interesting, plenty of information, visual elements. Thank you so much. We have quite an extensive number of questions, so I will just jump directly to the question to allow everybody to, or at least as much as possible, to have the questions answered. I mean, the first set of questions is pretty technical. They would like to know more about, I mean, more, I mean, quickly, about the farm size, what is the average farm size that is uh, irrigated? If all these farms are equipped with sensors and weather stations and other different technologies, and what, I mean, how much irrigation has changed the productive life of these people? Meaning, I mean, were they growing cereals and then they moved to olive oil or fruits or fodder or, I mean, more high value crops. Over to you for a quick answer, please. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so our average, within our client database, the average farm size is 50 hectares. That's uh, above, uh, pretty much above our national average for Portugal, which is around uh, 14, 15 uh, hectares. But in the south of Portugal, we have a, a large, uh, larger uh, plots, larger farms. So the average here in the south is around 40, but within our database, within our client database is 50. So uh, most of the farms are big. Of course, we have some areas that are below five hectares. We have uh, 12, uh, 1,200, no, uh, yeah, 12,000 um, 12, hectares that are of farms be below five hectares, okay? So small plots. But the average, in fact, is big. Um, regarding the increased um, the increased revenue that water brings, it's very, very interesting because statistically, in Portugal, uh, is I think it's exactly the same as the, um, the the Spanish case. So it's six times, six times more. But we have cases here on our region of uh, ten times and fifteen times the income. So uh, usually when I, uh, when I, to simplify this, I, I, I'm saying that what we, we, we used to say that uh, we're putting a zero in your income statement. We were putting an extra zero. So if you're dealing, if you're uh, growing cereals and you're used to move uh, around hundreds, hundreds of thousands of euros and you will move to irrigated crops, you will move annually around millions of euros. So we will have another zero. And, and we have witnessed a lot of cases that this is true. Um, the, the, the gross added value for, for cereal here would be probably on the hundreds of euros per hectare. And, uh, and for olives, for example, is more than 1,500, 2,000 euros a year. Thank you, very interesting. I mean, keeping the discussion focused for one second on this technicality, what is the percentage of farmers that join the network in your area of, of interest? I mean, how much of the farming community has actually connect, have actually connected to the, to the grid, to the irrigation network? Okay, uh, that's also an, an important issue because um, in Portugal, uh, the the initiative for uh, creating the infrastructure is from the state. So the state uh, determines, oh, we're going to make a, an irrigation perimeter here. And they, of course, uh, the, the landowners are asked, do you want to join or not during the, the planning stage? So they are, we have a public, a public session and they are asked to, you want to participate or not? And if, if they do not want, it will be excluded, but then, to really use the water, it's up to them. They are not forced to. They just have, uh, um, um, every time they're integrated in, in a per in irrigation perimeter, they have to pay a conservation fee. So in fact, it's a tax to contribute to all the conservation costs. Um, but, and this process, this uh, con conversion between rain fed to irrigation, usually you usually take took around, around or more than 10 years. 
So in our initial planning, we were accounting for 10 years to have to reach 85% usage of the infrastructure. But this year, with less than, than seven years, eight years of, of, um, of being uh, distributing water, we reached over 100%. So we are now at 103% of, 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 the, of, of the usage. So if we divide the irrigated area through uh, by the projected area, we are at 103%. This is why, because there's a lot of uh, interest in the, uh, and a lot of farmers, not only the Portuguese, but also uh, foreign investors that are coming, they are, uh, well, Alkiva has popped up on the radar of, of a lot of investors worldwide. For example, the almond sector from California or the, the olive sector from, from Spain. And so they are coming and they're, looking for land and with the large investment funds, they are creating large projects and there it's a very uh, important boost for our uh, usage, usage, usage rate. Thank you so much, Pedro. Uh, one last question. I mean, your project is a public project and, and you, you clearly just stated that, you know, there is... Uh, it's the Yasna, not actually. Sorry, Lush? Okay. And that there is, you know, like a, a higher ground decision on on doing uh, this sort of project. There are public investments, there are foreigner investors, so it's kind of public-private, it seems to be at least from a funding perspective, a public-private partnership. Uh, and I was wondering, and actually the audience is wondering, what what is the governance uh, structure of all of this? Because, of course, you are... A, public company, so I'm, I assume that you work as a private company that it's owned by the state. So, exactly. But how does really, I mean, what is the governance of it? Like really in a few words, because we are going to probably address this as well with all the other panels, just to close your session and open the floor to the next phase of our agenda. Over to you, uh, Ed, uh, Jose. So uh, very briefly, there's the, the Ministry for, for the Environment is the National Authority on Water. So um, all the policies uh, drive from that, uh, are deducted from that. Um, at a, a regional level, you also have the environment, environmental, the regional environmental agency. Uh, but then at the irrigation perimeter level, then you have the operator. And our company, this public company is responsible for managing this very large uh, irrigation perimeter that in fact uh, encompasses 22 irrigation perimeters. Um, because most of the other uh, irrigation perimeters in Portugal are managed by uh, a farmers association. This is different, this project is different from a, just a traditional irrigation perimeter because it has a lot of obligations regarding the environment, regarding monitoring that drive from the, the environmental assessment uh, studies that were con con conducted in the beginning and then uh, there were um, th there's an environmental um, list uh, pr list of requirements that we have to comply and th th they are very demanding and this is why the state uh, thought that it's, it's best to have an, uh, a, a company a public company that's responsible for all these things from, from, from every subject Many, many thanks. Uh, let me let me just move forward. We we are already twelve ten. I would like now all the panelists to join uh, the the presenters to join in the um, with their video, if possible, to uh, address a bit a series of issues that appears to be uh, common to the. Um, to three case studies, I mean, Israel, Spain, uh, and Portugal. Let me first just very briefly uh, share with you what is my take on, on the three uh, presentation. Now, the number one, I think it's obvious to all of us and to all the participants, is that 
irrigation cannot be reduced to just, okay, I'm going to dig a channel and move water from A to B. It requires a series of elements. Not all of these elements are related to investment, to hard investments like you know, canals or others. We need to work on ancillary, uh, ancillary infrastructures. We need to work following economic and financial principles, but we also need to be careful at the social dimension of uh, our investment. So in other terms, it's real life. We cannot just deep reduce real life to a simple variable, but it's a complex set of variables. I think each of the three presentation give us specific details uh, on specific elements. I really enjoyed the emphasis uh, on research and development from the Israeli case, the importance of training and involving all uh, stakeholders from, uh, from Spain and of course from Portugal, the, the, the fact that we are looking forward and that we are integrating as much as possible all the soft variables into the planning, I mean from the planning phase. So there is from every presentation a bit of uh, good knowledge that could be uh, absorbed uh, by our uh, Serbian colleagues, make sure that irrigation in Serbia can take the best out of these examples, as well as from the many others available uh, around, uh, around the globe. Now, I, first I would like to ask the, the, the three presenters, if they have questions, they colleagues, and if so, please go ahead, feel free, you have five minutes to ask questions to your colleagues, to, to explore more on specific aspects that, you know, struck your attention or uh, that made your brain really excited about what had been uh, presented. If not, I will move with my own questions and, of course, to allow the floor to ask additional questions to be answered this time by the three of you. And please try to be as concise as possible and precise. Over to you, colleagues, for your questions. All right, since you don't have questions for uh, each of you. So I'll, let me let me break the ice and start with a series of uh, of questions. I mean, the three presentation we have clear that the role of institution is extremely important, but the role as well of the private sector of the farmers of farmer association, farmers cooperatives, any sort of let's say farmer aggregation is indispensable for the success of of the cases. Now, how much? In your experience, do you believe each is relevant? I mean, can we say that we can have a sound irrigation development without the involvement of one of these elements or the three are equally needed or one is more important than the other? Over to you, please. Pedro, do you want to start answering? Uh... Well, um, we, I think for sure the, 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 the institutions are, are very, very, very important. And um, also le legislation is also very important because we have to um, account for um, the, the more severe years. Uh, right? uh, if every time we are creating, we are creating capacity um, the, the natural tendency for the, the, the economical agencies will, agents will be to, to um, completely use it, right? To, if we make available a certain amount of water, if that water is creating uh, uh, wellness and it, it's creating uh, richness, then the economical agents will have the, 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 the willingness to um, completely use it um, at its full, at, at its extension. And um, we, we will have uh, difficulties when we reach our maximum capacity. And it was very interesting to hear about uh, from the Israeli, inside, uh, 
Israel in policy, uh, as they determine quotas. Uh, and, and we are missing that in Portugal. We are missing that, that policy because we have been fortunate enough to, to do not have so much restrictions. But we will have for sure. Um, so we have to learn with the, the Israeli, we have to learn with the Australian, we have to learn with all these geographies and all these countries that are far, that have far more demanding uh, climates than us and um, learn how to cope, to cope with, uh, with scarcity, with uh, water scarcity. I think that will be the, the, the major problem for, for the future. How can we enforce um, um, just laws, just uh, schemes to manage water scarcity? Pedro mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say a few words about, about that. First of all, you know, water is considered a, a global uh, problem, or people say challenge, but the solutions are local. And as Pedro said, every geography is different. Uh, and also, as Pedro said, every geography will eventually reach a demand that cannot uh, comply with the supply or with the availability of water. And uh, in some cases, uh, I would have a country where there's abundant uh, water in one area and, and uh, lack of water in another. So uh, I, I believe that today the world is fortunate enough to be able to, to plan this. I mean, we, we look at climate change and we try to build models 50 and 100 years uh, forward. We are able to build uh, uh, models of our increase of population, cost of living, and uh, uh, we know the availability of arable land, uh, etc. The the best way to to mitigate such issues is by building a long-term master plan, which Israel has done uh, about ten years ago, and uh, um, the plan has to be comprehensive and holistic. The plan has to include everything. It can have areas where you don't need to monitor the water. That's fine. But it has to be a result of planning and not a result of some historical inertia. So I, I, would, I would say, let's take it from the top, from the government, by saying we have the tools to build long-term plans now. Let's do that. And in these long-term plans, we will know where to focus more, where to focus less on water conservation, on water reuse, on generating new water resources, or on changing agriculture. The crops grown today in Israel are different than those uh, 40 years ago. Okay? We don't need to put everything on irrigation. We can also tell the farmers, uh, okay, look, irrigation is an issue. Rice and cotton uh, are not going to be popular in our country. That's also okay, and that's what uh, uh, what needs to be considered. Many thanks, Ryan. It's very important element that you know we need to be holistic, and we also need change how farming is made. And, and this was all clear as a result of all the investments that you described. Mulada, any any comment on 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 this discussion? I, uh, the experience of Spain is that uh, collaboration is vital. The collaboration is vital between the public administration, private companies, the user, and I have to also add the investor. The innovation uh, is, is, a, is a clue in, all, in this moment that uh, we face the climate change. But uh, we need the collaboration of the fourth, because uh, as uh, Pedro said, uh, administration, public, uh, the public administration put the rules that uh, we, the, the, the rest of the stakeholders must to follow. Um, uh, the, the private company is, is important. They are there all the time and they have to put all the technology in the, in the field, but the user, must know the new technology and there is a, um, we have to create, the, the public administration in Spain is, is, 
is, is thinking uh, how um, is, is trying to put this uh, new technology uh, in the in the in the far uh, is because that the training is so important and the investor must to collaborate with all the system also to to put the innovation that are uh, the, they are investing in the far also how to create the, the channel to uh, communicate the, the innovation to the farmers. Um, in all of these, uh, all the four stakeholders, I think, I think they are so important. It's one in its role, but it's important uh, for the system uh, to, to, to function, to work. Many thanks, Immaculada. I, I would say that the three answers you provide drives me to, 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 an, you know, to a follow-up question. I mean, how, I mean, in what measure agriculture, agricultural policies are relevant in, in ensuring the adoption of, uh, of irrigation? This, of course, if, if, we, if we talk about mega investments as, such as those that you describe, it cannot be close to a five years scenario. I mean, it has to look uh, I mean, much uh, further down in time. Like Pedro was talking about uh, olive oil uh, grows and, and, and other type of crops only to be productive. This requires at least three to four years. So there is a long-term vision and how much irrigation is and irrigation needs are influencing the agricultural policies and how much vice versa over to you. Pedro, if you want to start with, with your answer to this. I'm, I'm sorry, Yaku, can you repeat the question? I was... Sure. I how much irrigation needs and irrigation policies are influencing the agriculture development policies and how much agriculture development policies are influencing irrigation. If you can tell us from your cases how the two are moving, because sometimes what we see is that there is major emphasis on irrigation, but the entire part that also Ran was you know, talking about before, meaning that also farming has to change and that you also described, it's not very often taken into consideration. Now, in the three cases that you presented, it seems that the two goes at least uh, side by side, but it's not always the case. So how much do you think this should be pushed for, this parallel yes. work on agricultural policy and irrigation policy? So to... Yes, for sure. They have to go hand in hand. Otherwise, uh, you will have infrastructure, but won't have uh, farmers using it. Um, what we had in here in Portugal is that, well, uh, the, the, the state created the conditions. So the public sector created the, the infrastructure and started at the initiative, uh, did the studies. Um, it was very much criticized. Uh, this project was criticized by the lo a lot of different sectors and there was a lot of controversial around it. Um, from the environmental uh, sector, um, so, and also from the, the people that were just saying that it wouldn't work at all because there, there wouldn't be enough water and the dam will, will, will never fill up and uh, uh, there will never be uh, interested farmers, you know, farmers interested in using the water. There were a lot of myths around this project. What I think we were very lucky to, to be is in, in a really uh, interesting region with a very interesting climate. So a lot of uh, the temperature is good uh, for a lot of crops. Uh, the soils are, grew, are good. We are uh, well in the, in the corner of Europe, but we are in Europe. So the lot, a, lot, a lot of players that want to be in Europe. Uh, Portugal is a very interesting uh, Way, way in, in into the European markets. And, um, and we offered something that it's almost uh, impossible. We cannot offer really, but it's uh, guaranteed water supply. We really cannot offer. We just offer a technical uh, guarantee or a statistical guarantee. Of course, we, if we have something like the Australian had, the, the Millennium drought, a drought that lasts for 10 years, of course, we won't have water for, for a 10 year drought period. 
but we can offer a guarantee that the system is designed to have four years uh, of, uh, of drought, can sustain four years of drought. That's very, very interesting for the investors. For, for the investors, especially the ones that want to grow perennials, the ones that want to grow trees, because they don't want to put a lot of money there growing the tree and then you have a dry year and they all die and the investment goes down the drain. So water guarantee for us was very, very important. Um, but the transformation was made by the public sector. Of course, um, the, 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 the European policy, the European common policy for agriculture um, was very important in, in fostering uh, the investment, the private investment. Uh, now we are at the end of, uh, of, of uh, another period, but in when we had money and when the, the money was there for from from Europe, it was very 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 much uh, an important aid for the investment because if you have forty percent uh, for free, the, if the if your investment is forty percent less, uh, it's it's a very strong incentive to to go forward. And so all these players they took this into consideration, and this is why we had such a a fast change. Uh, the, the conditions were there, the policy was there, the money to support the investment was there. So everything came together and this is why we had this transformation in roughly five years, we, we changed the landscape. Many thanks. Ryan, what's uh, your point? What's your yeah, let's say maybe a few comments uh, quickly. First of all, Let's remember that technology is a tool, not a target. Uh, we, we don't put drip irrigation because we think it's nice. We'll put drip irrigation if it makes sense to use it. Incentives can come in the form of grants. Uh, they can also come in the form of uh, funding programs or uh, uh, spreading the expense, okay, such as loans. And, and that way they, they are uh, more able to assure that the investment is sustainable because what we don't want to see is we don't want to see uh, an irrigation system installed and not used. Right? Uh, so so the, these, uh, uh, these systems need to be installed in a, uh, in a reasonably economic and, and sustainable uh, response to a need and then it, it's not a problem. So, uh, and, and as I showed, there are many alternatives. I mean, drip irrigation is, is one alternative to advanced irrigation uh, technologies. And even drip irrigation itself, there are many types of drip irrigation. There are many types of drip irrigation management systems. So uh, I would say that incentives are important, but we need to, to give the right incentives. Uh, for example, you can install a system for free, but if you put it in a place where it's not needed, it doesn't matter. Okay. I, I, maybe one more comment. Uh, we, we sometimes talk about the farmer, but uh, again, there's sometimes national interest. If the national interest in Israel was primarily to, to survive in the beginning, okay, uh, national interest in, in Serbia is uh, also to generate uh, an international market for crops. Or crop products. So in that aspect, uh, the, the purpose of the incentives could be different and it could be balanced by national export and not only by what it does to the uh, economics of a specific farm. Many thanks, Ryan and Some final thoughts? Before we leave for, for some last minute question from the audience, for you. I agree with uh, my colleagues. I have to add in the case of Spain, is, uh, agriculture is vital. Uh, we are great producer of food and it's important for food security in the first uh, uh, step. In the second, we are exporter also. So irrigated agriculture is very important for, for us, for our country. And it's, the, it's a demand of the, the farmer that the administration has to, to progress in the irrigation policy 
to, to make the, the irrigation uh, areas uh, more sustainable and uh, permit the, the, the improvement of these areas. But it's, I think it's uh, both sides, uh, the administration is involved because we have to guarantee for security and the, the exports and also the environmental issues must be compliant and uh, it's because of that we are so involved um, at the same time the farmer uh, demand the involvement and uh, uh, the support to, to, to cope with all the uh, difficulties that came from the climate change or other issues. Many thanks, uh, Immaculada. I, we still have a few minutes left. Uh, just a um, side note, we do have a poll of like that's run. You can all answer to it, feel free. Uh, the version that is available via this Zoom webinar is in Serbian. The English version will follow via email, via email with all the other informations that we have discussed. Uh, let me just go back to two sets of questions that we, I'm, I, I am forced to combine them. Now, one is very much related to water prices. And my understanding from a series of questions is, I mean, how much the cost of water is on the shoulders, on the state's shoulders, and how much is really covering the, the cost. We had already discussed this with the Israeli case. Would be interesting also to see the Portuguese and Spanish uh, examples. Uh, and the second set of questions relates again to technology and digital uh, transformation. So if you could just tell us how much you think it's relevant to train and work on research and development, but also in transferring this knowledge to the new generation of agriculture uh, and irrigation experts. Over to you for water price questions. This time, I would kindly ask Immaculada to start with her uh, comments and to, to run on as last as he has already answered during his intervention. Over to you, Immaculada. As I said, the, the cost of the water is an issue of the other ministry, the Ministry of the, the, trans, the Ecological Transition. And in, as I, I could say that uh, there is a, some part of the cost, if, if we, we talk about the infrastructure, the cost of the infrastructure, there is a part that is supported by the, the public administration. And also, on, on all the time, uh, the, the farmer uh, must pay for the cost of the water in all the cases. In some cases, they pay more or less, it depends on the, the, the availability of the water, the source of the water, as I said, but they have to pay to, uh, there are two types of, um, I don't know how to say, uh, impostors, uh, taxes, that they have to pay uh, related to the infrastructure that has built by the by the government, and they had two taxes that ha they have to pay uh, by force, and these taxes depend on the basin and the uh, the quantity of water and the type of infrastructure. In Portugal, of course, is, is more or less the same. We, we are all we are all under European law, so the European water law says that exactly what Immaculada was saying. All the costs have to be all the costs that are are necessary to get the water to the farmer. They have to be ref reflected in the price. So this is European law. Of course, the Portuguese law says exactly the same. Uh, and in, in the Portuguese state, we have. Three, um, the price is divided in three different uh, components. So we have the conservation fee, which is paid by hectare. You have the usage fee, which is paid by volume. And you have the infrastructure fee. I think in Spain, they have a, a different kind of approach because most of the farmers, if they want to be inside the perimeter, they, they have to pay a little bit of the investment, the initial investment costs. In Portugal, that's not the case. They don't pay anything in the beginning, but they they will have to pay something in the future. So um, to get to that uh, 
to that level where we are starting to recover the investment costs. Okay, that 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 um, that, uh, that investment costs recuperation um, is now starting really in Portugal. Um, the, the tradition has been only to charge the, the, the users for the variable cost, not for the initial investment. Because there's uh, this concept that is also verified already, especially in the, in the Alkiver project, we have a lot of studies around it. Uh, the state rec rec can recover a lot of costs indirectly uh, through increased uh, um, revenues in taxes. In, in uh, VAT and in revenue taxes, so uh, in, in social cost, social taxes, there are a lot of taxes uh, where the increased uh, economic activity that will generate uh, increased taxes. And so, um, for for us, just I, I didn't give you the, the number, but in the Alkiva, uh, the the cost, the total cost, if we put it all together, it's between four cents and eight cents if it's pressurized water or unpressurized water. So gravity water is really, really cheap. It's re we, we use a lot of energy, but still it's, it's a different ball game if you're comparing to uh, desalination or um, reutilizing wastewater that's always, always far more expensive. This is Pedro. Uh... Rana, any last really comment on this in addition to what you already shared with us during the presentation? Over to you. Well, I, uh, basically everything is included in the water price. Uh, what, uh, what I find um, uh, maybe my, my role in this set would be to answer the question about digital technologies. Uh, digital technologies uh, are not only in water. But of course, uh, in water, they have a, a huge impact because it's a relatively traditional and, uh, and less digital field uh, until today. They help us close cycles much faster by bringing information, more information on quantity and quality, real time, and more information on more locations of usage and sources of, uh, of water. And on the other hand, it allows us to uh, manage and distribute information and also manage uh, uh, the system, the water systems uh, remotely and quickly and, and see these uh, operations, uh, close cycles as much as possible. Now with climate change, not only global warming, but also there will be more extreme weather conditions that will almost catch us by surprise. So we, we need this, the, the whole pace of events is getting uh, much faster and the, the digital uh, technologies helps us there. The other dimension is of course uh, precision irrigation and it, precision irrigation is not just giving every plant the exact amount, it's also giving uh, at field level or at uh, acre or hectare level. Uh, precision irrigation as a concept allows us to be more effective in the planning and operation of uh, irrigation systems. So that would be another aspect. It definitely uh, requires uh, incentives for development and uh, it's, it's a national uh, uh, interest to do that. And uh, implementation is as needed as I explained before. All right, many, many, many thanks. So we have touched on several key elements. Um, I'm particularly interested the main focus also of the, of the questions were more on the soft side rather than the uh, infrastructural side. I, I think we can go back home saying, yes, the infrastructure is needed. Indeed, we need to have an investment, but we also need to invest in policy development. Planning is a key element to success, and this planning should be as much as possible realistic, participated with all the stakeholders and includes the multi-dimension of uh, that, that, that characterize irrigation. So the environmental, the, 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 the visionary part by saying this, meaning to look 
not at the next five, six years, but at the next 30, 40 years. The knowledge transfer, the research and development, and let me conclude, though we have not touched upon it, the easy maintenance, operational maintenance of all the systems, because this is an aspect that we did not touch too much. And I would like to remind all of us that as much as technology is fancy and interesting, and as much as we have billions to invest operation and maintenance, it's very important. So by doing, by saying this, I would like to thank all the panelists, to thank very much our um, participants. I'm glad that we had an average of 110 attendees during the whole uh, uh, webinar. I would just leave the floor one minute to Tamara to give us a few hints and explanation of what will follow. And then I will gladly thank all of you for your kind support and participation. Tamara, over to you, floor is yours. Hvaljamo se takođe svim učesnicima i govornicima i panelistima i na živoj diskusiji i velikom broju pitanja koje smo dobili. U mailu koji će uslediti po završetku ovog webinara bit će obezbeđen link na snimak, dakle kompletan webinar je sniman i dobit ćete link na snimak, prezentacije, pitanja na koje nismo imali mogućnost da odgovorimo prosto zbog ograničenog vremena, kao i anketu na engleskom jeziku koje je tokom webinara bila plasirana na srpskom jeziku. Veliki broj zainteresovanih učesnika je se registrovao tek nakon što je webinar već počeo. Imamo preko 30 registrovanih učesnika dok smo mi svi već bili na webinaru. Njima smo u nekom trenutku uspeli da pošaljemo link da se priključe. Onima koji se nisu priključili takođe će biti prosleđen link sa snimkom webinara pa će imati priliku tako da vide o čemu i na koji način je bilo reči tokom ovog webinara. Ja se zahvaljam, Jakopo. Okay, so thank, thank you everybody. It was a very fruitful uh, meeting. Uh, I, just to double check if uh, Milian, Wafa or Emmanuel have some last word you want to say. Uh, the floor is yours, otherwise we can close the meeting and thank our attendees for their very relevant questions and participation. Over you, uh, Mian Wafa and Emmanuel, if you have any, and of course, the Water Management Director, if there is any last word from them. No, I just would like to thank everybody. It was really very, very exciting and very interesting. And the discussion was was uh, very, um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, interesting in the sense that it can give some very good guidance to, to Serbia and how we have to move in that uh, in the project and guidance to us in implementing the project. So yeah, I agree with you, the planning, the, 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 the governance, the participation of all the, the uh, users of the water, as well as all the you know, policy aspects uh, for incentives and non-incentives is, is very important. So thank you all for, for being there and it was really exciting. Glad to meet you all, thank you. Thank you very much, Afa. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Milos. Milian, over to you. Uh, thank you, Kopa. I know I'm not going to be taking much of your time. Thanks again for everyone and indeed for all our guests today. Um, to me, it just shows that there is plenty to, to, for us also in the bank to learn, but also probably to, 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 to our friends and partners in Serbia that you know knowledge transfer and experience for more advanced markets it's a key in order not to, you know, to, to, to get the best uh, practices and lesson learned. And I think this is exactly the platform and this project is, is, is precisely designed for, for this. So I do hope that 
certainly, you know, Emmanuel and, and I were exchanging a little bit of messages. We just realized that there is a lot of work to be done, uh, and we do hope that FAO and ourselves, together with the with the Serbian authorities and the people in the, in the relevant uh, institutions, you know, and all the stakeholders. Um, we have plenty of work to do and, 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 and build up on, 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 on this. Uh, this is only the beginning of the, of the journey, obviously. And uh, I do hope that we as a bank will be also playing the role, not only in investments and, and financing the capital investments, but also in many soft components from legislation and everything else that we see is going to be needed to make uh, the, 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 this infra sustainable and, and address the all issues that uh, all three of uh, experts have been uh, have been mentioning today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milian. I I think if unless we have any last minute comment from the World Management Directorate, no, we can we can really close this event by thanking. Our panelists, presenters, excellent job, fantastic, thank you so much. And uh, say goodbye to all uh, the, uh, the panelists, the attendees, and we will follow up shortly. Please have a nice afternoon and goodbye to all.